Hello everyone, welcome again. We are right now on YouTube, on live. Thank you everyone. I would like to, to greet uh, our, our speaker, our next speaker, uh, Professor Pedro Morin. Pedro, Professor Pedro, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Well, hi. To, hi, glad, everyone. Glad to meet you again. It's a pleasure uh, uh, having your presentation today. Thank you. We are going to wait a few minutes to begin. Okay. Uh, okay. We, we are going to share some videos until we are going to begin. Okay. Thank okay. You. okay. Thank you for Super. being with us. Thank you for being ready. Uh, uh, Juan Carlos, please, could you play the videos? Okay. Okay. Yeah, este profe está compartiendo, entonces. Yeah. I, I can stop, I can stop if you want. Yeah, please. Thank you, Pedro, thanks. Okay.
Hola, soy Julián Guerrero, estudiante del doctorado en Ingeniería de la Línea de Energía Red Mutis. Soy estudiante de primer semestre de 2020. Eh, dada la modalidad del doctorado que es en red, eh, creo que el doctorado cuenta con las herramientas para asistir a nuestras clases desde nuestras casas, contaba con todas las herramientas, he tenido el apoyo del personal del doctorado para cualquier inconveniente y hemos aprovechado muchísimo la plataforma Tema con los profesores para interactuar, para subir nuestras actividades. A mis compañeros les recomiendo conectarse directamente desde el modem para no tener problemas con sus clases. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Eva Giraldo, soy auxiliar de la Autónoma de Occidente, que hace parte del Doctorado de Ingeniería con la Autónoma de Manizales y la Autónoma de Bucaramanga. Les voy a contar mi experiencia en casa. Mi experiencia en casa ha sido algo nuevo para mí. ¿Por qué motivo? Porque no me encontraba preparado para realizar teletrabajo. No me encontraba con un espacio adecuado donde los docentes me pudieran escuchar con claridad. No me encontraba con un buen equipo de cómputo, menos con una buena conexión a internet. Sin embargo, esos problemas se lograron solucionar y ahora estoy afrontando todo esto con compromiso y responsabilidad. es un espacio de reconocimiento y enriquecimiento en donde la comunidad académica y científica del doctorado en ingeniería escucha todas las propuestas de doctorado de nuestros estudiantes reconoce sus avances reconoce sus fortalezas y les ofrece realimentación de su precio sugerencias de mejora enriquece a través de, de la interacción con la comunidad el ya excelente trabajo que vienen desarrollando nuestros estudiantes así que los esperamos todos en el Innovation Camp Juan Carlos. Este. Más abajo, más abajo, más abajo, por favor. Más abajo. Más abajo. Ese, primer encuentro, por favor, gracias. Ese, 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 ese. Ahí lo tienes, ahí lo tienes. Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Reiner Tabre Soto, perteneciente al doctorado en Ingeniería en la Línea Informática. Pertenezco a la Universidad Autónoma de Manizales y vengo a hablarles del proyecto que, que formulamos para la última, la última convocatoria de conciencias referente a la pandemia del COVID-19. El objetivo de nuestro proyecto es desarrollar un sistema de información que permite integrar servicios de soporte, diagnóstico, monitoreo y seguimiento epidemiológico con el propósito de facilitar la toma de decisiones relacionadas con la pandemia del COVID-19. Para lograr este objetivo, ¿nosotros qué necesitamos? Primero, desarrollar un modelo computacional basado en inteligencia artificial que permita la detección, de la imagen, que permita la detección de la, del COVID por medio de imágenes de rayos X. También necesitamos desarrollar modelos de analítica descriptiva y predictiva eh, de la curva, con el fin de predecir la curva de COVID. -19. Y de necesidad de un sistema de monitoreo y seguimiento de los pacientes a través de un reporte detallado de la, eh, de la sintomatología y desplazamiento de los pacientes positivos con el virus. 
eh, en, este, en este proyecto participaron entidades como son el Centro de Informática y Biología Computacional BIOS, la Alcaldía, la Universidad Autónoma de Manizales, las empresas privadas de la región y centros, un centro de investigación en España, el cual nos está facilitando una gran cantidad de información. El proyecto no fue aceptado como tal en la convocatoria, pero nosotros seguimos trabajando en el proyecto para que desde la alcaldía y desde la ciudad se pueda implementar este proyecto. Muchas gracias. Okay, hello again, welcome everyone. It's a privilege, uh, it's a privilege to me to welcome all of you and also to welcome our next speaker, Professor Pedro. Professor Pedro, again, hello. How are you? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to present your CV. Professor Pedro is an assistant professor at Industrial Engineering and Management Department and AFAUP, and also an invited professor at Porto Business School, lecturing co courses on supply chain and operations management. Since 2016, he is the head of the Research Center for Industrial Engineering and Management for INESC Technology and Science. In, for, in 2014, boutique analytical driven consultancy company, which applies advanced analytical methods to help make better complex decisions. He was a visiting scholar at IESE Business School in Spain and also in Carnegie Mellon University at the, at the States. Recently, he has been supervising and conducting numerous national and European funded projects, as well as co-authoring more than 40 research papers about supply chain management, retail operation and optimization. His undergraduate education and PhD degree is at Industrial Engineering and Management from University of Porto, Portugal. Professor Amorim, uh, welcome again, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor George. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So let me also start by thanking Diana for uh, for this uh, invitation. It's uh, with a great pleasure that, that that I accepted. We are all in this um, weird situation of not uh, having the possibility of meeting face to face. So it's always good to have something that resembles that, even if it's a, a Zoom uh, conference. So um, I know that the delay has been long. Uh, I, I know that you started at 7 a.m. looking to these um, different interesting uh, research projects and also different uh, invitees here uh, discussing with you uh, all these interesting topics. So I, I try to be, I will also try to be as interesting. I, I don't promise that. It's also 8 p.m. in Portugal. So uh, it's, um, it, it's quite a journey on, so far for me too. Um, but the idea here is that I will try to guide you through um, the interest and the impact of business analytics in this uncertainty era that we are living on. And in particular these days, I think this, is, this applies very, very, let's say, very precisely as with the, all the COVID uh, thing, uh, definitely we, we need to understand the role of analytics. And it was interesting that the last video actually talked about an application of analytics to, uh, from one of your students to, to tackle um, uh, uh, the COVID um, problem and I, I will try to be more on the business side and understand how business analytics can help you in, in different processes of, of a company. So um, and I kind of wrote a subtitle here that I would like to both touch the marketing side and also the operation side. So I will look at the client side if you want but also at the core of what of how companies operate so to the operation side. Great. So, and you know, the challenge for me for this talk, and when I started to 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 thinking about to think about this, was shall I really talk about analytics? Um, actually, I guess uh, there's a lot of news uh, in the last days that told us that uh, actually analytics is not uh, that interesting, right? Because it seems like it's not being able to really capture all these e crazy effects that we are seeing happening with uh, with uh, with COVID. A lot of models really didn't work. 
all our forecasting of the needs that we needed of toilet paper and all these different products didn't really work out also. So uh, analytics was somehow under fire these last uh, days, right? So my, my goal throughout this talk is to convince you that actually analytics is still quite important and there's a role for analytics in the different processes of companies. So there's definitely a role also for PhDs to develop better analytics to, try to, you know, to tackle this uncertainty such as the, 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 the COVID emergency that we are facing nowadays. Okay, so my really my, my point here will be really to show you that you know when companies are realizing that that you still can be competitive through analytics and maybe we just need better analytics and let us discuss what is better analytics is and how what we should change in the different processes of a company. But before that, and actually connecting again to the previous video, we talked a lot about analytics. I think it's a very broad field, right? And there's really different types of analytics. And I would like just to start by making sure that we all capture how these different uh, uh, fields of analytics evolve. So in the most basic analytics, what I would call is descriptive analytics. So descriptive analytics means that we are looking through the rear mirror, like when you are driving a car and you see through the rear mirror, right? So you are understanding what happened in the past, right? And so if you would be talking in an asset management problem, for example, understanding how a wind turbine will, uh, you know, how, how the maintenance of a wind turbine will be in the upcoming years. On the descriptive analytics stage, you would maybe, you know, look at the equipment, understand the results, see how many failures the equipment had. So it's just really looking at the path, right? Maybe one step ahead is understanding what, uh, what really happened, right? So maybe correlating the data that of failures to the wind or to storms. Right? So you start to do what we would call diagnostic analytics, right? So it's not just looking at the past, you start to understanding a little bit the past. But of course, no one likes to drive with a rear window, right? Or the rear mirror, um, better thing. So you want to go forward, right? And you want to predict, right? What will happen actually? Can I predict based on the past behavior, how will the turbine actually, the wind turbine actually behave, right? I, I foresee a very severe winter, for example. How many you know, maintenance schedules should I actually uh, um, program in order to make this equipment look good in the, in the next year? So, so that's about predicting. That's about forecasting, right? And definitely one of the main pillars of analytics. Um, but it's not the only one. There's actually more than that. And more than that is all of what I would like to call prescriptive analytics. So prescriptive analytics connect much more to what we would call in general operations research, right? So optimization problems. So here is not just like looking into what will happen in the future, but it's much more prescribing what the, the decision should be. So since I know that the storm will actually probably endanger the, the performance of my turbine, you should go there three times every month. Okay, great. So that's another step is having models that actually are driving decisions, right? So that's kind of a, a next step of the analytics. That's actually the step that I find more interesting. Because this step is close to the human interaction of the machine together with the human, right? So we are really looking into decision making. And ultimately, we are talking about transformational analytics. So analytics that really shape the way we take decisions on a daily basis. Being it to understand how do I schedule the beds for the COVID emergency, being it in a more prosaic uh, example, um, talking about asset management. But you actually can follow this ladder of analytics from the descriptive to the diagnostic, predictive, prescriptive, and transformational analytics in the most various projects that you can imagine within a company. Being it the production planning, being it distribution planning, marketing planning, financial plan planning, you name it. Whatever process of a company is, I believe you can really go through this ladder of analytics. And my goal here will be to tell you, you know, what changes uh, in, in the, with the uncertainty that we are living on. But before leaving in, sorry. But before I, I tell you about that, let me let me tell you where I believe analytics is more interesting. So here in this slide, you kind of have different levels of decision making within a company, more strategic decision levels, meaning decisions that you take every five years, for example, more tactics, right? More technical decision, tactical decision level, decisions that you take every you know six months, or more operational decisions that you take every day. And actually, in the operational side, we already have a lot of analytics going on, right? Every time 
we, for example, in a company, we schedule the route of a Coca-Cola and understanding where shall I deliver Coca-Cola to my client. You know, there's already, already a lot of software doing that. There's already a lot of algorithmic um, aspects that have been incorporated in the way the, the companies tackle these decisions. When you go to the strategic side, what is the next market I should be investing in, right? What is going on in a macro level? Well, in that case, I think analytics will be pro probably not the best approach, or you should not just rely on analytics because actually there's a lot of, you know, um, things that will be hard to be put on a model, right? So maybe we leave that more for, you know, empirical uh, approaches to actually uh, tackle these decisions. But at the tactical level, when we think in the next year, in the next few weeks, in the next months, how shall I actually tackle the, the shortage of capacity in hospitals to tackle uh, the, the COVID issue? How will I actually, you know, design my production planning because now I see that my suppliers are failing because they don't, you know, maybe they have a labor shortage or whatever. How will I actually do my production planning to still be optimal, but under the new circumstances? That's where actually retailers, or sorry, not retailers, practitioners do a poor job. In the statical decision maker, what I would call an helicopter view, you know, looking to the ground, but at the same time looking um, uh, with the, your hand standing up, it's where actually analytics can play, uh, uh, you know, a nicer role. And that's where actually I will devote most of my, uh, of my time here throughout the presentation on the statical decision making level. But before jumping there, I would like to actually, you know, grab your attention to the fact that, you know, on, under these uncertainty times that we are living in, it's where we see the pitfalls of the way we have been taking decisions. And the pitfalls have been there the whole time. We all have, for example, um, took a single scenario approach to projects, right? We usually just look at the average. So on average, I think I will sell 10 Coca-Cola, so I will just, uh, you know, buy 10 Coca-Colas. Well, but what if your supplier fails? Right, so we, we usually don't think about the worst case scenario. So single scenario analysis has been there as a limitation for a long time. We also, we also are very static in our decisions. We take one decision and we have trouble in pivoting between different decisions, right? Going back and forth is really not the way we really like to manage. And again, under uncertainty, it's really important that you have a, a, a good stance in, in terms of flexibility, right? The third thing is that we, we don't, you know, details are boring, right? So people really prefer top-down approaches that you don't really have to deep dive so much in detail. But you know what? If you don't understand the underlying mechanism of how a given phenomenon exists, it will be really hard then to see how it will change under different conditions, right? And of course, we also look a lot to the past and we leverage a lot of internal data. Not, and what I mean by internal data, we look at our sales data, but nowadays, maybe it's more important to look at tweets right, or look at the Instagram uh, uh, pictures that we are seeing nowadays of toilet paper or whatever to understand how demand will be shifting in the upcoming times, right? So what I think this, it's like these days we are seeing this iceberg surfacing, right? It's not that we have been right now, just now doing poor decisions. No, we have been doing poor decisions all, all way along. The problem is that when the scenario is not changing so much, it's okay. When things start to change, that's when the problems arise. Also, the iceberg starts to come up, and then we, we have an issue. And we see these problems, uh, the single scenario, the static, the static plans, the low level of granularity, they actually impact whole process, the whole process of companies. Starting at demand planning, understanding how much will I sell of each product, going to the resource planning, understand how should I shift my capacity planning, how many resources do I need, how do I actually, how much do I need to buy? So, and, and, and also on the marketing side. So in the rest of my, my, my time, I will try to cover these three vital processes of companies, demand planning, resource planning, and also how you actually do marketing. Uh, I might not have time to cover all of them, but that's not an issue. Okay, but let's see how, how far can I go and we'll, we'll uh, um, leave, leave it as it is. Let me start with the first one. And I think we really need to start where everything starts. Right? Everything in a company starts with understanding what is my goal, what I will be actually looking at, and that's demand planning. Demand planning means forecasting. Understand how much will I sell of each one of my different products. And 
you know, these days have been tremendous because um, everything we knew about how people behaved was, uh, you know, was changed. So here I'm showing you a picture from one of uh, our uh, Portuguese leading retailers of how different products have evolved uh, when you look at this year and the past year. And you see that the pattern is really hard to understand, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, again, uh, COVID, we, we went into curfew more or less around March. So you really see this. So that, that's in the blue uh, shaded part there. So one, e-commerce, of course, has risen sharply, right? People just started to buy online. So the question now is, will this be a trend to endure in the future? In one year time, will we still be seeing this trend or are we reverting it in the near future? Big question. I think a lot of dollars there in understanding how, or euros in our case, right? In understanding how all this will shift in the upcoming future. What about spices and sauces? I don't really understand what's going on there, right? But probably people are cooking more at home. They need chili, they need pepper, they need salt. So suddenly we saw a dramatic shift in spices and sauces. Will people be shifting really in their habits and, and cooking more at home? Uh, great question, I guess. Then we also saw that the most, I would say these products that are not so essential like perfumes and cosmetics, you know, they have gone really down, right? So people are not so worried about putting perfume because they are just not going outside. Can you predict how this will evolve now? Will it be like this again? So, and of course the obvious canned food that everyone started to buy a lot, but actually it's interesting to see that we saw a peak, but then people actually don't like so much canned food because it seems like we are not uh, eating that much uh, it anymore. So again, this is just a couple of examples to showcase how important and how difficult it is to predict that. But it's, of course, through analytics that we, or at least analytics should be part of this, of this recipe. And to my understanding, when we talk about demand planning, we talk about three different stages. The generation, so coming up with models that are able to generate good forecasts of what go, what's going on. So... That's the first thing. And of course, one thing that needs to change here is that, is that you, don't, you just don't need one estimate of what's going on. You need an interval of confidence. You need to play with uncertainty. And playing with uncertainty means that you, do, you cannot just aim for one single output. You will have to have a band that you can play around. And then, of course, there is the monitoring part, which is, I guess, is also very important. After you generate, you see things unveiling, and certainty is unveiling, and you want to monitor that. So you need all the descriptive analytics, all the dashboards, all the Power BI, the Tableau, whatever, name it. You want to have all these um, tools in place to be or to be able to actually understand how how you if you have a good error, a bad error, and how you should validate and regenerate new plans. Of course, there's, more, there's a lot of fancy ways of doing that. And I, agree, I think that nowadays the models that are you know, uh, going forward are models that don't rely so much on past data, but what we would call causal models, right? So models that actually work more on the basis of regression. It could be a simple regression, right? It could be more sophisticated things as machine learning type of regression, regression trees, gradient boost machines, there's a lot of uh, different regression methods under machine learning that we could use here. But definitely through causal methods, we can be more, let's say, proactive, right? We can understand better how the different inputs, you know, the social economic scenario, the, the, if we are in the state of emergency or not. So actually by bringing the causal data, we can avoid looking at historical data that is completely contaminated and that we actually cannot really do a lot with that. And just to give you an example of one of the projects that I've been involved with in the couple in the last months that uh, have to do with the forecasting is forecasting. Imagine that you have a new product and this is a case for uh, a, a, a company that is launching a new product. In these, in these times, how do you forecast how such a product will behave, right? One, the product, the, the market is completely confused. And second, it's already a very disruptive product. So it's a technology product that is, is being very, uh, you know, it's very disruptive to the market. In these cases, I think we need to combine really the best of both worlds. So business analytics, machine learning is still very effective, but all our knowledge as, as managers, as engineers, all our knowledge that we can bring into the analytics world is of tremendous importance, okay? 
So all the structural knowledge that we can bring to combine uh, into having a better forecast of how things will be going, it's, it's, it's the, definitely the way to go. So just to give you this example, which has been, uh, you know, I've been working on it right now. So I think it's, it's a great example to show. Okay, so gone. We have, we have tackled it. We understood demand planning has been disrupted. Uh, we need better decision-making, maybe more causal methods. We, of course, analytics is still very important, but okay. We grab that. We have now a good confidence interval of what will be the production of beer or the, the, the demand of beer, not the production, but the demand of beer in the upcoming months. And I'm sure that in a lot of countries, beer has been rising their sales as people are staying more at home. Um, so now that we have that, how do we look at resource planning? How do we look at the interior of my company? How do I know how much should I produce of each one of the different products that I have at my disposal? So I think the key word here is that you need alternative scenarios. You need to understand based on your demand, not one production plan, not two. You need to be able to set up a module, you need to be able to set up decision-making procedures that will allow you to iterate very often on your decisions. It's not enough to do this once a week or once a month. You need to do this daily. So the important thing is to be able to shape up the, your decision models so that you can run them faster and more often, right? So, of course, in this decision, and when you look at resource planning, you, you, there's a lot of things that you need to, to, to take into account, the inventory levels, the service level that you are providing. But of course, capacity in particular is being very uh, disrupted nowadays. This week, I was talking with some uh, uh, one of the largest multinationals of fast-moving consumer goods. That they pr produce detergents. And the guys are based in Amsterdam. I was talking with them, and they were telling me, how hard it is being to uh, navigate the capacity uncertainty that I have these days, right? Because people get sick, maybe a couple of guys get infected. How do I then understand which products shall I prioritize? Which ones am I not doing? And to do that, to take these decisions on a daily basis, you definitely need to be sure that you are able to have a process that goes very bottom up from, you know, from understanding the needs of your clients to really having a detailed uh, operations, sales and operations plan um, uh, in place, right? So I guess the key word here is you need to be fast. You need to be interactive and you need to make sure that you do this loop of generating scenarios, analyzing them and deploying them, right? And for that, you need optimization, right? You need optimization models. You need simulation models. You need also to be able maybe to have a good interface so that managers, of course, can do this on the fly very quickly, right? So you don't want to be uh, having a, a very uh, cumbersome process to be able to go from A to Z in this, in this process, right? So let me try to structure a little bit more my, my reasoning. I think you need to be able to create alternative scenarios, and that has maybe to do with the recovery. Nowadays, we all talk about the V-shape, U-shape, L-shape. I've been seeing W-shape. No one really knows what shape will be the recovery. Um, hopefully there's a recovery, right? But we all know that it will be hard to predict what the kind of uh, recovery. Of course, you have a lot of different ways of tackling that recovery. Maybe you dedicate lines for white beer and then for dark beer, another uh, uh, line, or maybe you just adjust shift, you are able to still bring people and maybe I have extended shift. You know, there's a lot of different operational levers that you can use. The importance is that for each of these decisions, you know what is the optimal plan. So if suddenly you understand that actually you are witnessing a U-shaped recovery, great. Then I know how much I should produce of each one of these things. And of course, how do you know what is a good plan? You need to have KPIs and holistic KPIs. You need to look at the cash flows, the service level, occupation, you name it. KPIs that are important for your business. So, so if you are able to create alternative scenarios, have this uncertainty perspective, optimize them and evaluating these different scenarios, I guess you are in a good position of navigating through these, through these uncertainty. So let me give you an example of a, a, um, um, let's say a, a, an interface, but actually a module, a decision-making model that we have created for one of our largest um, uh, beer producers here in Portugal. 
where actually the, the, the managers, they are able to run these scenarios uh, in an intuitive form as you are seeing here. They can set up, maybe now they value more, you know, the cost of inventory is, is quite important because they don't have space in their warehouses or maybe over time is something that they also want to value. They can play around with the different business metrics um, that, that are important. They upload, they run, and, and they go uh, after this, right? So what is underlying this beautiful interface is actually mathematical optimization models, right? So this runs an optimization uh, model that delivers the decision maker with the optimal plan for whichever scenario that they uh, uh, need. So before this, they were actually having uh, two or three weeks to run one scenario. Now they need 10 minutes. So that's, that's the beauty of it, is that suddenly you, you just don't do you know, one iteration of your decision making, you do hundreds of iterations and the output will be better quality. So I think sometimes it's not just really about you know, how good your models are, is how you are able to embed this in the ecosystem of the company, right? So that's the really the key important thing that one should be able to, to, to take. Great. Another aspect that might be interesting for you to look at is just, it's not just really about uh, understanding, let's say, the, the big things that will go in on, that will go on, meaning the production plans, the inventory, all of that. Maybe sometimes you really need to look at the inner of your company. Because, you know, we all have this social distancing, for example, nowadays in companies and in particular in production lines, how will social distance impact the productivity of companies? And in that case, we are going really into the low level of granularity. And I think the type of analytics you need is completely different. It's really not about optimization anymore. Probably what you need is simulation, right? You need to go and understanding now that I have my employees separated four meters from each other, how will this separation impact actually the production plan, right? So um, you need to recreate the factory to the low level of granularity. So this is an example of a, of a, a, a project that we have done recently in a, in a similar project to, to the one that I just described you. And here we went really, you know, it's not, it's, we, you don't describe a line by a number saying that the line produces 2,000 2, bottles an hour. No you go and you model each one of the bottles that go on the line, right? So you go in really in detail and you anticipate what will happen. What, why? Why are you having all these troubles? Why? Because then you can test different scenarios. You put a guy 10 meters from each other or 10 meters from each other, and you see actually what is the output that changes, right? How much is the output um, harmed by these different scenarios? And again, I think this is a tr uh, business analytics can really be helpful in that in that regard. Great. So I've been going fast. Um, I cannot ask you to let me know if I've been too fast. That's the problem of doing digital conferences, right? But um, I, I'm imagine that uh, that um, uh, more or less on time. So the idea is that again, I told you about the different pitfalls that we have been going on in terms of decision making. We understood how demand, how customers have been changing so much in these different times, uh, uh, indeed, in, uh, you know, in, through uncertainty, and we understood how we can tackle that uncertainty. We then moved into the interior part of the company, but I think we have maybe forgot one step here in the way, which is how do I really reach my customers? Because customers nowadays are being, you know, a little bit dragged away from business, right? We, we cannot really uh, interact with customers as much. So how can we actually still be doing good marketing and in particular targeting marketing? How can we still offer the best thing to each one of our clients? And definitely here, analytics can be, again, uh, a, a great lever for, for tackling a good uh, target marketing approach. But before we jump into how we should change this, all this approach, let me just guide you through what I think uh, are you know, trends that we are seeing in the way people are changing nowadays on the whole uh, customer life cycle, actually, from the beginning, from the engagement side until, until they, they start being our client. So the first thing is that we are seeing, you know, fast moving consumer goods, they are trying to bring as much new products as they can into the pipeline, right? So there's a lot of new products coming in either because we are at home and we want maybe 
you know, not a small package of rice. We want a large basket package of rice because we are just cooking a lot, right? So even if it's on on the packaging side, uh, if it's uh, to be more, you know, healthy, uh, maybe food because people are more at home, so you want more healthy food. So there's a lot of trends that actually are stressing uh, the innovation pipeline. On another hand, we cannot contact physically with clients, so the digital experience has been completely disrupted, right? So there's a lot, all these uh, digital experiences that are now much more important, but still, I believe that the omni-channel experience is really the thing. The omni-channel experience means we still want to go and grab our groceries at the store, right? So how can we really blend the digital and the physical world is still, I think, something that we don't really fully grasp. Very importantly is that people are unfortunately losing power, purchasing power, right? So we know that there's only one way uh, uh, out in this. And I, he, I think here there's no uncertainty. Spending will be cut. We just don't know by how much, right? But definitely spending will be, will be uh, cut. And there's also a lot of, you know, you don't really know how customers will behave in the upcoming future. So again, another scenario of a lot of uncertainty. This is a nightmare for marketeers. How and we actually, you know, help to navigate this sea of uncertainty. And the same way as we talked about in demand planning or in resource allocation, fast decision making is crucial. And I cannot stress how important there is, right? Because fast decision making means that you need to have analytical models, being it descriptive, predictive, you know, uh, prescriptive, whatever, you name it. The important is that you need to iterate through these models much more faster. So you need reliability in your models. You need to, you need to have, be confident. So the companies that didn't do that beforehand, so before all these crises, they will be really in trouble, right? Because so you in your PhDs, and for some of you will be working on these topics, it's really, this is a super timely topic, being able to really look and understand how can I build reliable models that can be, you know, injected to the company. And I'm, I'm you know, I have a very, I, I'm, I love science, but I love science, especially that is able to create impact, right? So we really should be, uh, um, you know, targeting this type of models that can then be incorporated within company. But okay, let me go through the cycle that you usually go in a, uh, when you are targeting a client. And you start usually by segmenting your client. Is it, you know, what kind of client is this one? You score your client. I mean, what does it scoring mean? You means that you look at the different products that you have. Maybe you have Coca-Cola, iced tea, water. What does my client want? So how likely is he to buy this or the other thing? And then you move and you actually, okay, now that I know what my client likes, I tell him that this is the offer that I believe it's more interesting for him. And then, of course, you try to grab him either in a text message or email or with a banner or, you know, an email letter or a letter to your uh, postman. Great. This whole cycle is being completely disrupted, right? We, who is my customer? I don't know. Maybe the guy got fired last week, right? So there's a lot of uncertainty on who the customer are. So you need really to use different types of data and structure data. Maybe you want to go and look at the Twitter accounts and understand how the guys are behaving nowadays. Well, what about scoring? You are being, bringing new products into place. So if you're bringing new products into place, probably you need to learn fast how the guys are actually you know, adopting a given product. And to learn fast, you need to test fast. And to test fast, you need agility. So the ultimate keyword here is that you need agility in um, the way you test and you learn. So A-B testing, all these methodologies that we have been working on on science on the last years, I think they are very important uh, in, this, in this uncertainty time. And then, of course, you go and you need to be digital. So everyone that is working, I guess, on digital value propositions and being able to deliver a digital message, definitely they are better positioned to tackle these now. So we have been working in different projects on, on this customization. And again, analytics comes as a very important thing. So here I'm showing you an example of a, a large project that we have been you know, running for the last I guess, six or seven years, in which for each one of the 3 million customers of this retailer, we are able to give 20 products that are the most interesting products for this retailer. 
So this means that there is a super big um, mathematical programming model that runs behind that matches, of course, all the constraints from the business side because you cannot offer, you know, uh, olive oil to everyone because the, the, the supplier cannot handle. So there's a lot of operational constraints that you need to bring into place to be able to drive good decision making here. This should be, I would say, the level where you need to be to be able to tackle uncertainty, right? You need to be able to automate all of this right from the beginning, right from scratch, because otherwise it will be hard for you to then move into the steps that you need, as for example, bringing more external data and everything. So this is a great example of, of how you can really do this. Great. So five minutes, I'm, I'm almost there. I just wanted to really, uh, and, and you know, you've been overloaded with information throughout this day. I just wanted to summarize a little bit uh, uh, the scope of what I told you so far. So there's a lot of vital processes and companies that are being disrupted nowadays. We have been working in academia for a long time in understanding decision maker and an uncertainty. Um, and of course, understanding what are the best models to do that. But we still didn't, did, we didn't do a, a good job, to be honest, because companies are still not using our models. Uh, we are still not being able to transfer all this knowledge to the companies. And actually, maybe because our models still need to you know, be refined, maybe be more simplified, maybe, maybe be more explainable. I really don't have the answer. I just have the question. And the question is, disruptions like this will occur very more often. And definitely, we should be able to look at this from a more, for a better, from a better perspective as 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 we as time unfolds. So I went through three pillars that I believe are quite important on on uh, for companies in these days that have been heavily disrupted: demand planning, resource planning, and, and targeted marketing. And on demand planning, what you need to do is be sure that you have methods to clean out liars, understand what really is important and not for your model. Work with confidence levels is not about one estimate, it's about having a scope of estimates to understand what's going on. And of course, then be sure that all the descriptive analytics is there, all the you know dashboards are in place to be able to monitor and sense what is going on on the short term. Last but not the least, we need to be able to integrate much more internal data sources, like for example, sales data source, historical data source with external data sources to be able to drag, to draw, to, to draw better decisions. Regarding resource planning, you need to be able to, you know, iterate much faster. We cannot do a plan and hope that this plan will stick for the last two months, the next two months. No, you need to do this, you know, on a daily basis, maybe incorporate the new information that is arising to be able to navigate the trade-off between inventory capacity and service level in a much better way. So scenario generation is a key fundamental thing to be able to, you know, uh, to use. So stochastic programming, robust optimization, all these underlying technologies will be important to drive this, um, to this, this process of the company forward, okay? Regarding target marketing, we just we just looked how the life cycle of the companies have been, or of customers have been disrupted. Again, I think some of the key uh, key takeaways that we saw in the event planning and resource planning are important here. Being able to bring external data sources into place, being able to fast track your decision making, that's really uh, what you, you should be looking at. And last but not least, I think a word of uh, encouragement I've shown you three different examples on demand planning. I show you this example on this very innovative product. On resource planning, I showed you this example of the beer company. And on the targeted marketing, I showed you uh, the example of uh, the, the, um, the retailer, right? And targeted marketing with retailer. Let me tell you that each one of these examples, they led to, I would say, 10 or maybe 20 papers in uh, high-ranked uh, uh, journals. and two or three PhD thesis. So actually underlying all this practice that I tried to show you here today, because I, I, I felt, uh, you know, for a broad audience as you are, it would be more interesting to give you a broad overview of, of, uh, of how I saw this disruption and, and the link with business analytics. But the important message here is that underlying all these projects and the success of these projects were successful PhD thesis. Okay, PhD thesis and production planning, PhD thesis in 
in uh, optimization of marketing offers and uh, PhD thesis regarding deep learning for uh, better demand planning. So uh, a word of encouragement that definitely what you are doing hopefully will translate into impact in the future and uh, that's the way you should go. Thanks a lot, I think I'm just on time. Uh, so that's it, that was it from my side. Opening. To okay, thank you, Professor Pedro. Thanks a lot, this is a great talk. It was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, I, I, maybe we have some time to 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 answer some questions. Sure. I would like to I would like to comment about the importance of your of your topic, the importance of your of the of the knowledge you uh, has had shared with us, because you know uh, this is all about decisions, and I guess uh, it's important to try to transfer this technology to the public, I guess. I guess uh, some, today we need to increase our effort to transfer this, this, uh, this knowledge. Could you share us something about your experience with your, mm -hmm. your enterprise mm -hmm. about to transfer this yeah. very, very, very useful and very, very important yeah. knowledge? Because I guess it's really important to, to design new, new enterprises to craft new opportunities. And I guess in this time and in, in times of COVID-19, I guess enterprises are looking at organizations are looking for this kind of solution. What could be the, the, yeah. the capacity of the organizations to, to cope, who, to learn, to appropriate mm -hmm. this, this knowledge. And thank you again. This is mm -hmm. a great, great conference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, Professor George, I think I think um, so. Let, let me let me go a little bit back in time. So um, we were um, here in Portugal. So we uh, I, I've done my PhD in 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 2000. So I ended in 2012 or 2011. So I started in in, in 2009, if I recall correctly. And uh, at the time, we saw that companies were starting to be. Um, more prone to listen to what we we could tell them in terms of you know the models that we develop. However, companies were also afraid sometimes of the academic world because they have maybe bad experiences in the past and they maybe were not so eager to cooperate because you know maybe uh, sometimes the, the project didn't ended up well. So my experience has been that you need to be very frontal and understand that there are different engagements that you can have between companies and, and uh, academia. So in my research center that I, in the research center that I manage, we have, so in ESCA, in ESTEP, we have underlined three different ways of engaging with companies. The most and traditional way would be to set up a long-term research project. And it is long-term research project, as the name says, you don't really have defined milestones. You go, you have a broad scope that you want to analyze, right? And you uh, actually build uh, uh, week after week, month after month, year after year, how, uh, you know, knowledge that can help both the, the, you know, the academic world means that you can actually generalize to other industries, but also that particular company. But we also say that, okay, maybe not all companies can go into this 40 year endeavor. It's not very common. Right, actually to have uh, right that in Portugal. Maybe in the US, it's more common, like oil industry, for example, have been doing that for a long time. When I was at Carnegie Mellon, that was very common, but definitely in Portugal, that was not so much the case. There was a second level there for me, which would be like a medium term, more project. So in that case, maybe a PhD student comes together with a senior researcher and they kind of craft a project that is more tailored maybe for one year, and it has a defined scope. It is aligned with the thesis of the student. And actually the, the company also sees a way of recruiting the student maybe in the end. So it actually works out pretty well. But most of these projects that I've done actually with companies, I have to say that they were very time defined projects, maybe nine weeks, 12 weeks, 15 weeks in which we actually brought all our mathematical programming expertise or statistical model expertise for a particular problem that was well-defined, but that I would say general consultancy companies could not really help them because it was too technical, right? So our, let's say, uh, technical expertise as, uh, in my case, engineers that are able to, you know, to, to develop and deploy quick uh, models 
were the case. But then I think the question rises, but that's not science. And I agree, that's not science. So in our case, what we did was that we did that in nine weeks or whatever week to gain access into what the, really the problem was. And we got data until what the problem was. And we solved not, I would say, from a purely academic perspective, right? So the problem was not perfectly solved, but it was good enough for the guys to have the solution, to give us some money and to give us more importantly, data and for letting us reflect more, think more about really what the problem was. Okay. And so actually that has been kind of the most uh, successful cases that we have was in that uh, red card. And that led actually ultimately uh, to create a spin-off. So LTP, this logo that you see here was a spin-off of the Faculty of Engineering where we now have 50 consultants that are um, trying to bring these, uh, uh, to this state-of-the-art knowledge to the companies in a more professional way, professional way. Okay, so that's what we are doing right now in a, in a lot of different industries. Oh, it's really interesting. I, I, I was thinking about the, the experience with PhD students and your PhD program and your enterprise and the experience to transfer mm -hmm. all the knowledge. Yeah. I, I think this is a great, really great issue. Uh, also, I was thinking about the trust, the problem of how to build trust between the enterprises, organizations, mm -hmm. and the academia. And uh, in the in the morning in the morning we were talking about the same thing, the issue mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. how to build trust, how to transfer mm -hmm. knowledge, how mm -hmm. all is about working together and build that that trust. And mm -hmm. I guess it is really, really interesting. I would like to know something about uh, your simulation models. Yeah. Do, do, do you do you use uh, do you use uh, several uh, several techniques, the yeah. uh, optimization, yeah. system dynamics, mm -hmm. agent mm -hmm. based? What could yeah. be your experience? Because I guess also that could be really, of course, analytics is is a, an, a very important topic for our students, and also yeah. your experience transferring, uh, doing yeah. transfer. Yeah. But also the experience with simulation sure. models. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sir. Sure. Okay. So super. I think that's a great question. Um, so I think simulation is kind of this uh, double-edged sword in the sense that for companies, this is the best thing ever because they see things moving and uh, yes. they love, right? So in terms of uh, gaining trust is uh, super, right? Okay. But nice. the truth is that from, for example, from a scientific point of view, I find it very hard to do publications with simulation, right? So there's yes. kind of a drawback to that. To yes. be honest, most of the times, so in talking about the software, we have been using any logic most of the time. Yes. So any logic is this, uh, you know, multi-platform, um, uh, multi-method actually simulation, right? So we can use system dynamic, agent-based, or just yes. discrete event simulation within this platform. So it's, I think it's a great tool. But we have been mostly using it actually, I think more, I think I'm not sure I should say that in public, but more, you know, <laughs> for, for someone to see than actually to drive the system. Because most of the times, we have to taken the decision through maybe a mathematical programming model. So the okay. decision was already taken, I would say, most of the times through a more prescriptive techniques. And we just show the simulation to, to, to give more confidence to the decision. Okay. So let me give you an example. We, have, we were running, for example, the other day, a network designing problem. Where shall the, a given retailer uh, put the, his warehouses throughout the company, the, the country? And actually, this was pretty much an optimization problem, right? The truth is then there was some uncertainty on the, the, the time the traveling would take. And then we build a simulation model just to show that they would still arrive on time on that. But actually the decisions were taken. It was just a means of giving more comfort in the end. And so I, the, the nice thing I think about simulation models is that you can deploy them very fast. They are very effective and they help exactly in what you were saying, in building trust. Because suddenly uh -huh. it's not so much of a black box it's kind of yes. a white box or a transparent yes. box that uh, the decision makers can can take a look on. Because otherwise, if you start yes. showing equations about medical programming, it will uh, be not so easy to, to build that trust, I guess. Really, really interesting, Professor Pedro. Pedro, thank you. I would like to know if there is a question here to our great speaker. I would like to say again, thank you for this great, great lecture. Excellent, excellent Thank talk. You.
uh, Juan Manuel was saying here on the chat, it was a really excellent presentation. The uncertainty is the constant. Yes, this is also a really interesting I agree. I agree. issue topic. And I, I, I would like to say that the, all the all the area you present today, it was it was great the way to see all the whole picture, the whole picture mm -hmm. about the area. I think it was really, really nice. Thank you, Professor Thank Pedro. You. I, I don't know, I, I guess it's a little, a little late for you. And I would like to say uh, uh, on, on regard of this, uh, this community, the PhD program, uh, all the people are watching us uh, on YouTube. Thank you again. This was really Thank a you, great Professor conference. Pedro. And we would like to see you again, Professor Pedro. In person, I hope. Us. In person, in person yes, next time. Yes, I hope also that. <laughs> of course, please, please share with us. Please thank share you. an applause for the Professor Pedro. Thank you. Professor thank Pedro, thank you very, very good. much. I, I, we know it's, it's a little bit late there in no Portugal. Problem. Okay, no but thank you no again problem. for your patience okay. and thank you Take for sharing with us. Thank you, ciao, Professor. Ciao, ciao. Bye bye. Yeah. And I would like also to say, Bye bye, and thank you to all our uh, viewers on YouTube. Right now, we are going to close that channel, and we are going to have a, a, a short break. And then